I'm Steve Chow in Malaysian Borneo, where villagers are restoring one of the world's oldest rainforests. I'm Omar Khalifa, and I'm in the Philippines, where the humble coconut is leading the fight against environmental disaster. And I'm Sinead Ashe, and I'm in Sarasota, Florida, making reef balls. The rainforests of Borneo are home to some of the world's most unique species of wildlife, including the orangutan. But their home is being torn apart by palm oil plantations and by logging. I'm Steve Chow, and I'm headed up the Kinabatangan River to learn more about the corridor of life. The Kinabatangan stretches 560 kilometers into the heart of Borneo, and it's one of the best places in the world to see exotic wildlife. Hey, Mincho. Hi, Steve. Welcome nice. to Kinabatangan. Thank you. Nice Welcome. to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you, too. Mincho is not just our guide. This is home. He was born here and is today a wildlife ranger. He, with other villagers along the river, are leading the way in restoring the forest. Some see Borneo's fertile land as perfect for growing palm oil, which is used in everything from chocolate bars to face cream. But the local people have learned there is value in nature itself. Ecotourism is booming here, contributing much needed cash to the local economy. Yeah, and we're seeing lots of boats on the water, right? Yeah. Well, luckily, you're not yet coming during high season. Amat pagi. Good morning. Pagi. You must be Dariana. Yeah, yes. Mincho told me about you. <laughs> this is the village's nursery, the first step in rebuilding Borneo's forest. Dariana leads a team of women here. They're focused on growing 10 species of trees needed by animals like the orangutan to survive. Why do you have to grow so many different kinds of species of trees? Well, we are building corridor that is for wildlife. It's better to have many different varieties. So it's really look like a real forest. The idea is to create forest corridors along the banks of the Kinabatangan that connect the patches of jungle that have become isolated by agriculture or deforestation. So these saplings here are all grown up. They're ready for a new home. We're headed over to a replanting site just over there. The trees are planted in areas that at one time were taken over by timber companies and plantations. Yeah. All right. So Dariana here is putting me to work. Right, Dariana? You're making me work? Yeah. All right, good. <laughs> so so is... now it's not enough. It's not deep enough. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just putting the trees in the ground. They have to make sure they survive. In the tropics, weeds grow quickly, and the heat is unforgiving. They have to maintain this they place. They have to maintain. That is the hard part also in tree planting, because everybody can do tree planting, but usually they just plant it and leave it like that. So it's just waste time and money. And what's the survival rate if you take care of this place? Oh, 100%. 100%? Yeah. Eh? Once the trees have grown, animals should be able to roam more freely. So, Mincho, where are we? Now we had one of the earliest reforestation plot, which has started five years ago. Yeah. These are the same species of trees, yes. right? Yes, so in the future, your tree is going to be like this. In five years' time? In five years' time. It'll be this big. Yep, fast yeah. growth. And already, there are signs that animals are visiting the reforested area. So as you can see here, that's some of the elephant tracks. These are elephant tracks? Yep, they call Asian pygmy elephant, but believe me, they're not that pygmies. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it so important to reconnect forests? For example, like here, we have forests over there, and there's forests over there, but here it's empty. So it's hard for wildlife to move. So by connecting them, by doing this wildlife corridor project, we can also keep the forest more bigger size in terms of right now it's getting smaller, actually. So it's really important to keep the forest connected. So from the ground, it's hard to get a sense of the true scale of the fragmentation of the forest. So we're going to get a bird's eye view. We're going to take the helicopter over here. And this is Mincho's First time in a helicopter, is that right? Yes. How are you feeling? Well, 
I will try to hold my breakfast. You try to hold your breakfast. Yep. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure you'll do fine. So how is that, Mincho? Oh. When you see what we just saw, yeah. what does that tell you about the importance of what you and your village is doing? They should be proud because I'm keeping the only forest that, a few forests that left right now, and after seeing all the fragmented and the forest patches in the farmers surrounding it, um, yeah, it's just sad, it's just bad. So... As well as planting trees, villagers have put up rope bridges to help wildlife cross in areas where the canopy has been destroyed. We've brought remote cameras to see whether the bridges are working. Well, I don't know how the monkeys and orangutans do it so effortlessly, because it's not easy. Camera trap is down. This will be the first time that Mincho sees whether the bridges actually work. Oh, Ooh. look at that. We have some creatures here. So what kind of monkeys are these? It's just a long tail macaque, you see? Oh, somebody's, oh, look, a monkey's playing with it. So he's actually helped us adjust the camera a little bit more, which is kind of nice. Okay. <laughs> look at that, he's, ta he's, he's talking to it. So the rope bridge does work. Yeah, it does work. Well, the aim again is for the wrong time, but somehow with this sighting of other animals using it, it gives confidence for the wrong time to use it also. Mm. Uh -huh. So we just heard that there's an orangutan, possibly a mother and her baby somewhere down this way. So Mitch is gonna take us for a quick look. Where once there were several thousand, today there are just 1,000 orangutan left in this area. The place we're walking in is a wildlife sanctuary, off limits to the public. It's humid, it's muddy, and there are plenty of hungry, blood-sucking leeches. Well, you know, yeah, I've gone all hardcore with leech socks and hiking boots and Mincho here. He's going barefoot. You're embarrassing me, man. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I see a nest. Yeah, and that's the orangutan there. Orangutan's right there? Yeah, at the top. You can see in the middle of the branches there. In the oh, yeah, between the trees. Yeah. Wow. We're watching this mother and her baby They've given us a few warning sounds to stay a little further back, but besides that, they're allowing us to hang out with them. I think that's pretty cool. It's in reserves like this that you get a better sense of what the villagers are talking about, the need to restore the canopy so that the orangutans have more freedom of movement back and forth. Researchers have been tracking these orangutan for years to see how they're coping with the drastic changes to their environment. Among some things they've discovered is that this tree-loving species is increasingly being forced to walk on the forest floor. Their loss of habitat is also creating a serious problem of overcrowding. One individual they need at least five to six square kilometers, but in our area right now there is five or four individuals sharing one square kilometer, so. So you need more space? More space. More trees? It's not just a benefit for the species, but also for the local community, especially in, uh, in tourism, of course, in Kinabatangan. 
according to our research, uh, orangutan is the best agent to disperse seeds, to produce our trees, not just for us, but of course for the local community and also people around the world who, sh who are sharing the oxygen. So they actually help grow the forest? They help, actually, 100%. This place is incredible, but you know, the rainforests of Borneo face still an uncertain future. The palm oil grown so close to these protected areas is used by all of us, and the pressure to convert more forest is immense. Saving these vital areas, therefore, isn't just about one village, one town, or one country. It's about all our futures. are second only to the rainforest in their biological diversity, but they are being rapidly destroyed all around the world by overfishing and pollution. If this continues at the current rate of destruction, 70% of the world's coral reefs will be gone by the year 2050. I'm Sinead O'Shea and I'm in Sarasota, Florida, to meet the Reef Ball Foundation. Hey, over here. Hello. Just planting some mangroves. How are you? I'm good. How are I'm you? I'm Todd Barber from the Reef Ball Foundation. I'm Sinead O'Shea from Earthrise. Nice to meet you. We've been <laughs> looking forward to your visit. Unfortunately, man has created a lot of changes around the world, and those changes have impacted the corals. And we are slowly destroying the corals. We've lost about 30% in my lifetime. So it's our mission to try to replace some of that lost habitat. The Reef Ball Foundation is a nonprofit organization that works around the world in over 70 countries to restore oceanic habitat using reef balls and designed artificial reef technologies. How are y'all doing? I was just sitting out here doing a little inventory and getting a suntan. Hello, I'm Sinead. Great Hi, to Sinead. You. Larry Beggs. The factory and the Reef Ball Foundation are funded by governments, private organizations, NGOs, and individual donors. What we've got here, these are molds that we're going to use to make our concrete reef balls. You have a screwdriver I can borrow? Yes. Oh. Hey. <laughs> Leave it to her to bring a screwdriver to my work. There you go. So they just go in like Thank that. You. What are these for? When we pour the concrete in this mold, the concrete's going to flow all around these balls. And when we take it apart, they're going to make holes in the reef balls. And what's neat about these balls is they're going to create a hole that is shaped like a vortex. And that makes whirlpools when the water goes across it. And it helps make the reef grow faster because the corals that live on the reef actually are able to eat more because they're getting more water circulation to them. We're going to make it even more complicated by putting sand in the bottom. And wherever you put sand, we'll rinse it out tomorrow, and the underneath of a reef ball will be all wavy with caverns and holes. So things like shrimps and starfish that live underneath the reef that you don't see all the time have a place to live as well. Coral is actually an animal, and it, it swims when it's first a baby. And these baby coral animals need something to hang on to so they can grow and develop. While he's explaining all that, I'm going to bring the concrete truck in for us. A lot of special additives that we add to the reef ball mm -hmm. concrete to make it better for marine life. Okay. One of them is these fibers that are actually going to disperse in the middle of the concrete and make the concrete stronger. So when the concrete truck comes, somebody's got to climb up to the top and throw this bag into the truck. This is our reef ball. Yes, you're the proud mother of a new reef ball. And this reef ball is going to create more than 400 pounds of marine life every year, creating more than 20,000 pounds over the lifetime of the reef. It's like a dinosaur egg she wants to hatch. This reef ball is going to last in the ocean for more than 500 years, and the corals will keep growing, so it will get bigger and bigger. So eventually, this will become a natural reef. Wow, a perfect what? reef ball, look at that. Humans can create change, but we can also create positive change. In order to make the change, you have to put this reef ball into the water.
Okay, so we've come about two miles offshore and we're about to launch a reef ball. And now the fun part. We'll be able to go in the water and we'll unhook it and that'll be its final place for the fish and the corals to come in and set up camp and have a new home. So we've deployed the reef ball, but the fun does not end there. What are we going to do today? We get to go offshore and see some reef balls that have been down for about 10 years, and you'll get to see what your reef is going to look like in the future. The reef balls laid 10 years ago are teeming with life, and I can see why Todd and Larry have so much faith in their idea. It's truly beautiful. Our mission is to basically spread this technology to people to do it themselves so they can keep doing it and they can teach other people to keep doing it and it gets better and better. The number and types of animals that live on those reefs are incredibly diverse. There are sponges that grow on reefs that have agents that stop cancer. There are all kind of little animals we haven't discovered yet and who knows what keys they hold to our future as we uncover more and more of the complexities of life. How much of this is a passion for you? I will go and do this type of work until the day I die. It's, it's my life mission, and that's what I'm gonna do. When Larry Beggs, the guy you met, came to me, the first day I met him, he said, I love this, I'm gonna work for Reef Ball. I said, there's no jobs. He said, I'll make a job. And I said, how are you gonna do that? He says, I don't care, you just gotta promise me you'll never tell me to not make these Reef Balls. I made that promise, and to this day, you see, we work together, along now with 400 other people, and countless thousands of volunteers worldwide and it continues to grow and I hope it will always grow. The only thing that means more to me are future generations, my children, their children, their grandchildren, and the grandchildren of everybody on the planet. The Philippines suffers some of the harshest environmental problems in the world, from tropical cyclones and super typhoons to flash floods and landslides. It also happens to be one of the world's largest producers of coconut products. I'm Omar Khalifa in the beautiful region of Bicol, where we're going to see how coconut waste is being used to prevent natural disaster. Dried coconut meat, or copra, used to be the only part of a coconut with any economic value. The husk, which is 75% of a coconut, was traditionally thrown away. Before, um, billions of husks are just being thrown away by farmers. Okay. So we thought of way how to make use of this, as we call basura, basura. Here, in, here in the Philippines. First, we collect hass from the neighboring farms. One truckload is about 2,000 pieces of hass, and we pay them 100 pesos. Okay, so this is the coconut husk. Otherwise, it would just be rubbish. Yes. Basura. Basura. That's what here. basura is. Let's uh, get stuck in. We've got a lot to get through. Yeah. Hard work. Well done. Okay, let's go. So how much fiber do you get from a coconut? Uh, from the coconut, we can get 30% fiber and 70% is the cocoa peat. This is the decorticating machine. Okay. Okay, we have to feed the coconut has here and then it will come out on the other side, the cocoa fiber. Let's, Let's show them uh, how the up. machine works. All right. We just throw it inside. That's it. That's it. Whoa! That's up. That's dangerous. Yes. Wow. 
What is it about the fibre that makes it so good for the environment? Uh, when the rain pours down, it doesn't go directly on the soil. Mm. It will hit first the cocoa geotextile. Yes, yes. And so the, the runoff, it will uh, go through the geotextile. Uh, OK, so, so you're controlling the surface runoff? Yes, the, the surface slope. runoff. Rainfall is one of the most common triggers of land and mudslides. The friction between bedrock and the overlying sediment is loosened by the surface runoff and gravity sends the debris slipping downwards. In the Philippines, where rainstorms are frequent and landslides all the more common, coconut has a very important role to play. It's amazing how resilient this stuff is and even more incredible that they produce about two tons of it every day. And it's not surprising, given that Rex told us it's got a quarter of the strength of steel, that they put it in river banks so that it absorbs and keeps the flood levels down. Hello. Hello. It's <laughs> pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Oh, There's a lot of teamwork involved. I think I've done enough damage to this net as it is. I think you're probably going to have to redo it. <laughs> She's exhausted now. <laughs> this volcano is known as the Mayon, which in local dialect means beautiful. And looking around this place, it's no surprise because it's incredible. And we're on our way to a place called Gino Batan, which is where we're going to see how the coconuts are laid on the slopes. In this area, first we'll have to prepare the site. And then we have to prepare the slope before laying out the nets. Uh, this will hold the soil, so it will uh, to stabilize the slopes. OK. Yes. So when the tide rises? Uh, the surface, it will remain intact. It will remain intact. Yeah. And if it doesn't remain intact? Uh, there will be a lot of problems. What kind of problems? <laughs> uh, this bridge might collapse also. Then the water will uh, pass through this area. So and then the the place uh, beyond this area, it will be affected. Now, we will secure the nets by using bamboo pegs, which will temporarily hold the nets. Why only temporarily? Does because it on, in time, the vegetation will take over. And that's the aim of these coconuts? Yes. Right, as we can see, because there yeah. are some other nets nearby where we mm -hmm. can see the vegetation is growing through. Yes. This grass, we call it uh, the vetiver grass. We use this grass because uh, this has a very unique characteristic. The root of this can extend up to two meters. Two meters down? Yeah, it can penetrate beyond two meters. So that's not going anywhere. Do you feel like, in knowing that you've actually laid nets in these particular areas that are threatened by potential flooding, uh -huh. um, do you feel like you've saved some potential disasters? Yes. We have one project in Manila. The area near the residential houses, it collapsed. The government seek our... Uh, what's called that? Your help, your assistance? Yes. Yeah. And then we stabilize the slope. OK. So you're the go-to guys for coconut solutions? Yes. Come on. I have a tifanga. There's no snakes out here, is there? Slowly. Oh. <laughs> I think I've had some tangles in there. Oh, wait, wait a minute, where are you going? You're, are you leaving? I, I want to leave you alone from 10 minutes, I think. What am I going to do out here? <laughs> Only 10 minutes. I've just been abandoned in the middle of Virunga National Park. 